What do we have there? This is an official Reggae Pod Clash mug. What? You Nothing know about me? It tastes as good as it does out of an official Reggae Pod Clash mug. Mug. I like that. You know me and mugs. I love mugs. I love small mugs, big mugs, medium sized mugs. You little mug. I know. I'm a little mug. Speaking of mugs, <laughs> guess who's got a mug too? Ooh. That is a nice mug, Roger. That. Thank you. Wait till it focuses in. Focus. 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 <laughs> now it's not doing it. Well, oh, there, there we go. it is. There yeah, it is. It looks all clean. Dang. Take a Old school art for you guys. Old school reggae mug. Roger has better equipment than me. And nowhere is that exemplified as well as the close up of, uh, of that mug. Of oh, that mug? Here That's right. Let's check one more time for everyone up there. Close up. Wow. That Shoot is nice. That you can go to rootfire.net and get your own, your very own Reggae Pod Clash mug. Not yes. to mention shirts, hoodies, crop hoodies, mm-hmm. all kinds of shirts. Yeah, we're very stoked. And I think the uh, Reggae Pod Clash mugs that are on sale to the general populace mm-hmm. have the art on the other side. So, like, you can look at it while you're drinking. Right. We specifically requested outward facing art. Right. We're thinking ahead. For, yeah. For the, for the technology and for the, the perspectives and everything so you guys can see it and it doesn't look all crooked and stuff so exactly. go support it go support us please please do all the money goes back into the show we're stoked to be doing it mm-hmm. even if you know so yeah go and get yourself some new gear um speaking of mugs show today <laughs> yeah speaking of mugs who speaking we got of on the one show today, Rob? speaking of one of my favorite mugs ever my man uh mr ken stewart is on the show today and he is just a really cool dude i've known him for for a long time fellow keyboard player and he is a long time key the, the long time keyboardist of the scottalites how yeah. crazy is that to say i'm in the scottalites that's just crazy right there i'd say you all know? of us you know who are in our who are like our age right who yeah. are under 40 but almost 40 um who have seen the scottalites have probably seen you know our experience of the scottalites is ken playing with them yeah i would definitely agree i, I think every time i've seen him is with man with ken Right, back to the 90s. Yeah, definitely. So we're going to have him on in a bit because he's got so many cool stories uh, to tell, you know, and from his perspective, being in the band and knowing all the OG guys that were in mm-hmm. the Scottalites, I'm sure he's got just, just so much Just cool somebody who not only has so much reggae experience themselves, but whose right. brain we could just pick about, about just knowing so many different amazing legendary musicians. So it's going to yeah. be a good convo. But before sure. we bring Ken on, we're going to do what we do every week, which is play you some of our records. Yeah. This segment is called Tune of the Week. And I think I'm going to go first today. Go first. Uh, today I've got one of my favorite, favorite records. We always talk about, you know, oh, this is a record that I don't necessarily, you know, put in my DJ box to go play out. Well, this is a record I never leave home without. I always, always play nice. it. Nice. People comment like, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I knew you were DJing because you threw that record on. Mm-hmm. This is one of my favorite groups, the Gladiators, with a Studio One tune called Watch Out. Watch out, they will betray you. So I won't have them here right there. Yes, they will want to fool you. But red luck is better than them.
fire oh man i love that song so much that is watch out by the gladiators it's hard to find that tune um there's a there's a you know how like studio one would reissue stuff with like syndromes on it yeah it'd be the same version but like they'd add some stuff there's a version like that with the syndromes and stuff on um one of the gladiators reissues that i think maybe heartbeat put out but but it's not that it's not that uh right. same cut it's the same cut, but you know it's got the syndromes and stuff. But that one, there is a dub version you can get on one of the Studio One. It's, it might be Soul Jazz or Heartbeat, one of those um, like Studio One dub reissues. Yeah. You can find the version side. But anyway, I just think that that tune is like, it's. I mean, it's a scorcher, right? It's like super upbeat. Heck yeah! It's kind of a unique. I mean, it's a one drop. There's nothing like, like to me, it's a unique rhythm. Not because anyone in the band is playing anything super unique, but um, you just don't hear one drops that are that upbeat too often like that particular pocket that right. they're playing on that tune that's just like it's a dancey it's a super super danceable tune but but it's a one drop i don't know man it's just like one of those studio one things that's just magic you know yeah everyone is doing something cool you know everyone's talking to each other but they're you know i'm always listening to a song from that perspective right being a musician so you find, you know, the organs getting in where he can get in, the guitar players contributing where he can contribute. Right. And it, it definitely, especially any music coming from Jamaica, was not a computed thing. Like, no one's sitting back going, all right, we're going to compute this out and plan it out this right. perfect. Like, that's it's what all, we do now. We're like, let's make, it right. sound, let's make it sound like, you know, a, a 1971, you know, or a 1966. But, yeah, you're right. At the time, it was just like, let's fucking make it's, this just heavy. Exactly. Let's just play something good. Let's play. Good Everything's music. coming from yeah. the heart. Everything's just coming from you being a dope ass musician. That's all that is, um, and, and that's one of those songs for sure. And vocally, I mean, I love the Gladiators are just one of my favorite, um, just one of my favorite groups in Jamaican music uh, for so many reasons. I didn't, you know, next time we have Clinton Farron on the show, I'll play yeah. him that tune and ask if it's him on bass. It's it probably is right. It's such right. a dope bass line, but just Albert Griffiths. That's just, I mean. That's that's one I mean, for a singer who's got such a great a huge catalog of high quality tunes. That one yeah. is near the top of the list to me, and it's got that classic gladiator sound of Albert's, you know, on lead vocals, and then you hear Clinton with his like, you know, the ahs and oohs like no one else can do. He's just when you hear Clinton Farron do those ahs and oohs, right? He's because it's like takes over the mix in a really really great way, you know? Yeah, <laughs> texture, man. It's it's just a, a big painting. Yes. You know? I love I love it. So I'm going to ask next time we talk to Clinton I'm going to ask him all about that tune cuz I really that song is just that's a top 10 top 20 I don't know yeah. tune for me. I heavy just love tune. that one. Heavy heavy heavy. For all sure. right, Raj, what do you got this week? Well, speaking of songs that you always have in your record box, this I mean I don't consider this one to be a super hitter, but I do love playing it because um the A side and B side are like comparable, you know, as far as uh they're just bo both dope songs so i'm gonna play one side of this record this song is called your sweet love by ewan and the soul cats
Tough tune. Man. I dig it because, you know, it's got one of those, you know, like we talked about chuggers before. It's like a baby chugger kind of thing. It's going on, you know, it's got this nice. Speaking of chuggers. Speaking of chuggers, that's chug. What do we have in these cups? No one knows. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. Wet the whistle well, a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, this group, or this gentleman, you know, I looked him up and, and uh, you and McDermott. And there's not much. There's not much at all. Like one of those <laughs> artists we talked about that just kind of one hit wonders or whatnot. Um, released in 1969 on Giant, and the parent label was Randy's. And um, what I really like about this song is that, I mean, you have to go back and listen to it to kind of, you know, get what I'm saying. But the vocal melody, again, listening from like a musician's perspective, the vocal melody, it's a melody. I feel like there's a lot of times, you know, it's real easy mm. to just sing as a vocalist or, or, or write a song and come up with a vocal melody, but you're not thinking about the melody. You're thinking about the words. You're thinking about being in, you know, the, the key and whatnot, but you're not really thinking about, all right, take away the words. Does this really fit? Does this, um, is this successful by itself? Just being a, a melody you play on the piano. So, I mean, go back and listen to that. The everything is a melody you can hum. And actually the horns reiterate that later on. You know, bum, 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 like all that stuff. I like that in songs when, um, when the, the, the little break in the middle or the, or the, the, you know, the lead at the beginning is the vocal melody, you know? Right. It's not right for every song, but I really like that as an effect in songs in general. Mm -hmm, and I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of times, uh, especially nowadays, like, so, whoops, songwriters forget about that. You know, they forget that you can do that. Yeah. I mean, I think that. A, a cool uh, a cool method a cool way to approach a song would be you know as a and i really haven't even done this a whole lot but just sit down and write it as an instrumental you know write mm -hmm. write a melody out and then apply the words later there's been some really cool songs that come out of someone doing that and then and then you know applying the poetry if you will the the words and, and the lyrics you know a lot of ray uh, really good duos work that way if you even think of like i don't know elton john and and his writing partner bernie Ah, I'm forgetting his last name. John. But I mean, that's just a small example. I know it's not Jamaican, but that kind of thing from that perspective, writing a song. Um, yeah, I encourage some songwriters out there to take that route and right. see what you, if that helps you out. Or not, or I've never heard that song, by the way. It's, it's, it's rare to, oh. you know, not to, not to big up myself, but it's rare to stump me like that. And I, I definitely, like when you were playing that, <laughs> I was like, I never, I was listening, I was like, I've ne never, never heard this song. Well, I'm trying to stump you constantly, so. Consider me stumped. <laughs> Dude, we should have... The Giant label is, there's a lot of good stuff on that label. That's another yeah. one where every time I see a Giant 7-inch, I, I take a second look at it like, hmm. For sure. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. Yeah, most definitely. Um, you're right. There's not a lot on it. And the actual label, there's different labels for that yeah. label. If that no, makes yeah, sense. yeah, yeah, yes. You know, so. I've never actually seen the one that you have there, like the kind of like pale, right. pale one. But I've got some that's like white and then the Giant 
the the giant lettering is like mm-hmm. different colors exactly like red and maybe green i want to say or something it's right like christmasy almost exactly yeah that's yeah. the one people are more familiar with um i mean it's, <laughs> it even looks like it even looks like something you would just overlook in the record bin right because you know but it's a real trip because some of these 45s i'll be in the record bin or whatnot even if it's funk or soul and just because the label looks that simple it attracts you because you go hey wait a minute there's been a lot of really cool records out there like that that don't have the commercial, you know, King or Studio One, and you know, okay. Right. You know what, like, my, and this is, like, totally judging a book by its cover, but right. my my process before, like, back in the day where you couldn't hear sound samples of everything, you know, because now you just fucking pull out your phone and look it up on YouTube and see if it's a good song, you know, if you right. see a record somewhere, but... Back then, I, I probably would have passed on this record, and only because of the title of it. I, oh. I I was always like, okay, let me if the song it has some like super dread name, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm probably like buying it, right. you know. But if I'm like, uh, your sweet love by the Soul Cats, nah, I might <laughs> pass on it, and that would have been a mistake because right. it's a dope tune. There's plenty of songs out there, especially like in the funk soul circuit, where the name alone, you're like, this has to be a dope record, <laughs> and then it's just cheese ball, you know. <laughs> So, you know, like you said, with technology nowadays, you can just go and look it up. And I kind of don't like that. You know, it's like I, I know what you mean. I used to there used to be this on eBay. There was this Craig Moore who would uh, like once a week or once every two weeks would have these auctions of, se- of Jamaican seven inches. Mm-hmm. And you just you couldn't listen to them. And it was it was a little bit before everything was on YouTube, you know, because obviously it was it was eBay. So it was the Internet. But it's like you couldn't just look up everything. Right. And I would just take a chance on some of these records. And, you know, sometimes it would just be like, yes, this is amazing. And sometimes, right. sometimes it, was, it was like, okay, I see why he was selling that record. <laughs> yes, exactly. Totally. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a hit or miss sometimes yeah, with record sure. collecting. You'll notice record collectors have their, their stack of like, I'll never play these records. Right. And what do I do with them? Take one. <laughs> I'm going to have something like that at the at Reva Studios where it's like a giveaway bin. You know, like Roger Steffens has. Didn't, doesn't Steffens have like some kind of take one thing? No, I just steal his records. Every time. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's a story you were telling me that he just actually gives you. <laughs> quite, hey, we're live. <laughs> nah. So that so that original press, uh, one cup of coffee by by Marlon the Whalers <laughs> wasn't a giveaway, right? Okay. Uh, no. You're just taking. That, shit. I was like, yeah, this right. isn't the this isn't the giveaway bin. This drawer. <laughs> in the back. Oh, the reggae cave isn't the giveaway <laughs> bin. Sorry, <laughs> I, I, dang it. This isn't the reggae. This is the giveaway cave, right? Yeah, yeah, as you have a crate of like just dusty, dope records. You're like, what? What's going on here? Um, ladies and gentlemen, enough of us talking about records. Yeah, no one wants to hear that. <laughs> no one wants to hear that. Um, this next gentleman we're about to bring on has been a friend of mine for years. I've been fortunate to know him. He's an amazing keyboard player. Take him out of this whole story of Jamaican music, and he's just an amazing keyboard player. But he definitely is a part of an amazing story. He is one of the... The, well, definitely the only guy I know that has, has had a relationship and bond with all the original members of the Scottalites. Maybe not Don Drummond, but everybody else, from Tommy McCook to Roland Alfonso to Jackie Matu to Lloyd Brevett, Lloyd Nibbs, the list goes on and on. Without further ado, let's bring in the keyboard master from the Scottalites, Mr. Ken Stewart. Ray. Yes, Ken. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Devin. Ken. How you doing, up, man? man? Thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Oh, dude. Yeah, we've been wanting to get you on for a while. Yeah, you know, this has been a while. It's been a little while in the works now. It's finally, it's yeah, finally for happening. Sure. You just you just got done with the show, right? Right uh, today. Yeah, I was playing with my local, the local band that I play with called Soul Shot, which is based out of Westerly, Rhode Island. And we, they've existed for about 16 or more years. And I've been playing with them for about 15 or so. Right after nice. they backed uh, Alton Ellis, I said, "Boy, I gotta come play with these guys." Nice. Wow, it's good. Yeah, yeah. it's a good reference. It's good credentials. How are how are shows going over there? Um, where you're at? Like, what's the what? Paint the picture for us. A, a live show. Well, this particular thing was basically just a friend of our lead singer. Uh, it's a basically a birthday party. It was in a barn. It wasn't a public show. It was just for. Nice. You know, a private show. There was like maybe twenty people there, and most of them were outside the barn. But we set up inside the barn. And it was pretty neat. Nice. 
Was there hay everywhere? Was there like uh, a, was there any yeah, rig? Yeah, it's it's it was actually an old taxidermist's shop. Oh, ah. Wow! So there was quite a few deer heads <laughs> and a de a fox stuffed fox, a stuffed pheasant. Wow! Yeah, it was pretty pretty interesting. And that's it, a word I haven't heard in a while. Pheasant in a town called Marshfield, <laughs> which is you know next to Plymouth here, which was right allegedly the first town here and um marshfield is some place that uh, my family had a cottage that they built back in the late 40s and i sort of grew up in, at least in this part of the summers nice very cool dude um well let's just start from the top man let's start from the beginning you know because th th there's a lot of questions here as long as i've known you I think last time you and me were hanging out, we were driving in a car and I took you to Phil Chin's house to deliver some fish that you had brought or lobster me too, from me too. Maine. <laughs> so I have some cool, some cool things. I definitely forgot to ask you on those rides, but for everyone out there, Mr. Ken Stewart's been playing with the skylights forever, but let's take us back. Ken, what, how did you get into Jamaican music? What was the first band or, or how did that work out? Well, it was the secretary at my wife's office. Now my ex-wife, but my um, the mother of my children. This was back in '86. She says to me, "Oh, somebody wants me to go to an audition in Roxbury, uh, which is like a kind of a ghettoish part of um, of Boston." So she was a black lady, and I kind of chuckled. I said, "So you want me, the scrawny little white guy, to accompany you to this audition because you you don't feel safe?" <laughs> Basically, was what she she wanted somebody to come with her. You're the muscle. That's it, boss. Nice. So, but they also happened to be. She threw this in, and this was the ringer. Was uh, they're they're looking for a keyboard player too. But I didn't know anything about reggae. But I said, all right. I had actually just started experimenting with stuff that I was hearing, and I think Sting. Uh, released this album called Dream of the Blue Turtles. Might have been his first solo album. And I started, you know, there was definitely some bubbling, but they were like using a vibraphone sound. And it was a little weird, but, you know, I started to understand what was involved in bubbling and popping as they explained to me that that was what I was supposed to do and skanking and so on. So I met Coswell Jackson was actually the first Jamaican guy uh, that I played music with. And he ended up, when we found out, they called him Jocko. So I never knew what his name was, really. You know, a couple months went by, probably. So like, what are we going to call this band? And people said this, and people said that. And I, and I was like, Jocko, what's your name? And he was like, Coswell Jackson, man. So I was like, that's the band name right there. Right? There you go. <laughs> Simple. We have it. Yeah, man. Forget so, all the other stuff. Because he was writing some of the songs, and he was the lead singer, so it made sense. He's right. the man. Let's call it. That's a great name. So there it was, the Coswell Jackson Band. And that was the first moment that you were in a reggae band, correct? Yeah, February 1986. Wow. So then I went to the first big show that I went to was Burning Spear. Nice. At Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel in Providence, Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And it was the one of the first shows where he had the, the ladies on horns. Yeah. yeah. And they had just graduated Berkeley. Like they were fresh out of Berkeley. The whole scene was and I just wanted the combination of this slightly at that point he was only slightly graying Winston Rodney, and it was like the Bradshaw brothers, and um, Nelson uh, Miller maybe on drums. Nelson or? Miller, Tony, what's his name? It's my buddy T Bird, T Bird Johnson. T Bird. And he was playing keys, and just you know the whole thing was just amazing and so so hypnotic, and just you know Spears' voice like a trumpet. Yeah, like just intense, you know. Wow. And, and, so that's kind of, I was like, man, this is really something to this music, you know, because I grew up with pretty, pretty eclectic music in my home. My dad is a traditional jazz tuba player. Wow. Uh, also plays a little bit of trumpet, but he played with guys like Bobby Hackett. Um, he played with some famous dudes, you know, and right. 
so there was always music in the house, mostly trad jams. I started playing like Joplin and ragtime, this kind of stuff when I was pretty young. My hands were even so small, I had to like change the voicings on some of the stuff and still are really. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I've actually been playing my Jelly Roll Martin and my Scott Joplin tunes quite a bit lately. I'm trying to. Nice. Get the chops back up. Yeah, yeah. So, so you are you get into reggae music. You go to these shows. You see Burning Spear. And obviously, it's infectious and it's hitting you. But, All right. But so from the Coswell Jackson band, this is how it leads into the Scatolites. We went to Wilson Blue and the Blue Roots, who opened pretty much every show in Rhode Island from 1982 to 1998 when poor Blue passed away. But he was a really good singer. He was, he could play pretty much every instrument, at least well enough to explain how you can play your instrument, playing right. the music. So he was, you know, the other guys, it was mostly American guys in the other band. And so anyway, I started playing with this, this new arrangement. And they were literally like every, every show, like, here we are, open for third world, you know, and I get to meet, you know, Cat Core drives up, driving a Winnebago, which gave me the idea for this. This was the first Scatolites. Nice. Tour, which we used. Wow. 30 fun, 31 foot Winnebago. Wow. I was like, that's a great idea, man. You, Cause you saw like a five grand a, a week for a tour bus back then. Plus, uh -huh. you got to pay the driver and all this other stuff. And, you know, you just drive this thing yourself. It's like maybe a thousand bucks a week, you know, because it, like, it drove like a sled. Because, hmm. you, you know, that's got a station wagon chassis. It doesn't right, have of course, of course. And it drives like even driving into the gas station with like the dip. Yeah. The model. <laughs> so, yes, the moment. Take us to the moment that you. So How did that? Yeah. All of a sudden now, the manager of Wilson Blue and the Blue Roots, after I'm playing in that band for about a year, they look at me and they say, "Oh, our drummer can't make us to this, make it to this show, and we're going to use Lloyd Nib from the Scatolites this particular night on drums." I was like, "Wow." wow. Because I had seen the Scatolites recently, and I did before that, I didn't really know what real ska was. Right. So I just, you know, in, in about May of 87, I saw the band for the first time. And now all of a sudden, here we are. And now the story changes to Lloyd Nib is moving to our house, and he's going to be our drummer. Wow. And I'm like, no way. Like, you know, like real. Jeez, give like, me the like, top not, not my house. <laughs> <laughs> like yours, so, not mine. I was just all of a sudden he was there, like next to me on the drum stool. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we we had we hit it off very quickly, first day basically, and he was you know the new kid in town. He had come up from um, from King Bravo's house, which. That's another whole book, maybe, King Bravo. But King Bravo was a guy who had a house in Jersey where a lot of people stayed. Um, coming up, Tommy McCook, Lloyd Brevett, Lloyd Nib, Winston Grennan. Uh, I think Toots even spent a, a few nights there. Um, Bravo was also friends with people like Bobby Aitken. Um, just a lot, uh, and some of the, the younger upcoming Scatolites ended up staying there. Will Clark, uh, Bill Smith, I think, might have stayed there for a while. Kerry Brown, or one of them. Nice. Um, I'm not sure, but um, so as time went on, you know, uh, it became evident that the, the Lloyd had come there because nothing was really going on with the Scatolites. So Finally, I think it was close to six months. You know, we're talking spring of, well, I don't know exactly the chronological <laughs> right, right. order of things, but Lloyd was supposed to, there was an offer for a gig at SOBs for Scatolites. 
Yeah. And these people didn't want him to go. They're like, well, we can't get a sub for you. We're working that night. It's like, and I look at them like, so you're going to stop the scatolite. <laughs> right. Because you got to sub up this candy ass gig you got down the street. Right. Like, really? Because SOB <laughs> was the club of the clubs to play at. And, right. Uh, one of the major ones. And it was the small, you know, it's about 400 cap. And, but it was just the place to be, man. So anyway, I was just, at some point I left, you know, because I guess, oh yeah, that was, what, I asked Lloyd if he wanted to come up to a show in Boston. I was Third World was playing up at the channel. And, you know, I could go get, get him in on the guest list and all that. So we went, I asked him to come with me and the people that he was living with said, well, if you're going to go out with him, you can pack your bags and, and, and go. Both of you guys are kicked out of the house. He's like, what? So it became clear that this just wasn't a good situation for him to be, and they cut his pay. Right. They, Did they not? Let me ask you this. Did they not realize that this is like legendary oh, drummer? Of course. Yeah, of course. It was just that that wasn't as important. They, they had this situation. It was just a, a really bad, and I don't want to spend too much time. Right, of course. So you and you in a really negative situation. So we right, got right. To up to Boston, basically. Mm -hmm. The bottom mm -hmm. line, we got him the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. And we started, and this was another funny thing because I didn't really know the history of the music that, back then. And I said to Lloyd, I said, What's the name of a band that you used to use that you know we could use for Lloyd Nib and the blah da da? So <laughs> Lloyd said, Supersonics. So I said, all right, Lloyd Nib and the Supersonics. Like, really? Let's go. Right. So, having no clue that this was actually Tommy's band, and even especially that Tommy also had plans to revive the Supersonics. Oh, wow. Sonic. <laughs> that's crazy. You know, because that, that's another whole chapter. But so anyway, it becomes evident also that, you know, Jackie's in Toronto. Tommy and him don't get along. Wow. There's basically an opening for a keyboard player. And when I saw the band, it was Sidney Mills playing with him from Steel Pulse. And it was funny because I was hearing some weirdness in the music. And I figured, well, it can't be the old guy. The old guy knows the stuff, right? And then, you know, it's got to be the new guy. Like that young keyboard player has got to be, you know, making those mistakes. Right. Some because you could hear the skanks weren't meshing or something was. And then if you listen to the records up to now, John Jerry was not always right there with those progressions. Right. A lot of them, you know, there, there was one take. They kept it. You know, if it wasn't too major, they didn't cut it again. You know, it was like, oh, yeah, it's just one bar. Yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> and Coxon even said he kept he did that stuff on purpose to just to make it interesting. Wow. In that case, I'm really interesting when I record. <laughs> yeah, that's my, uh, that's so my about myself like, as a rhythm guitar come player. Come on, man! Yeah. I'm just I'm, I'm all over the place, but it's interesting, I'm right? Super interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coxon would have loved me. <laughs> so anyway, around February of '88, I get to audition. I go down, and we go to King Bravo's house for the audition, and it was, yeah, you know, I meet all. the... I had already met them sort of because I met them backstage briefly when they played at night stage in Cambridge when I saw them. Yeah. So, cause they actually, they had the same road manager with them that toots because I had already befriended toots before all this. So they, they had the same road manager. So I was in like Flynn, you know, I saw this guy, he was the driver slash road manager. And I saw the vehicle that Toots was always traveling in. I said, oh, it's Septi, the guy. He actually ended up being, that guy, Septi, he ended up being a ska record producer, I heard. But I haven't hmm. seen him in eons. Anyway, he was a Jamaican dude named Septi. I don't know what his real name was. Right, right, right. I'm sure there's people on the air that know who he was. Ah. Big up, Septi. What happened to you, man? <laughs> Wait, is that Septi in the chat room? <laughs> Knows. I'm sorry I can't see the chat. <laughs> no, he's, 
I don't think Seppi's in the chat. Yeah, I don't think he's in the chat. So, uh, yeah, exactly. No, I'm saying. So, so Ken, <laughs> we got so much to cover. So, give me the 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 meat of when you when you busted in with with the, the Scott Lights and and how that was. Well, so I went to the audition, you know, and it was kind of funny because the bass player, number one, I mean, it, it took them like 20 minutes before we could get sound out of it. Right. Apparently, Coxon had given him some makeshift transducer type thing that was had a short in it needed to be soldered or whatever and was just causing all kind of problems so we finally get into the music and not only does the instrument uh have something to be desired but the man just didn't really remember much of the tunes and he wasn't reading the charts so well and here's me like trying to hold it together and look good and so basically, it was decided that, yes, I could be in the band, but there was producers of a show. The, the immediate uh, thing on the table was this show that was actually with Mystic Revelation of Rastafari. Mm -hmm. Count Aussie? Yeah, but Count Aussie was already dead still, but oh, okay. was, the band was operating. You know? I guess uh, Sam Clayton, maybe, was still running it at that time. Anyway um that show i did not get to play on but i got to go to the rehearsals nice and watch this other guy this jamaican dude right. basically i think the that particular nature of the show they didn't particularly want to throw in the caucasian on the scatolites at that particular moment right right but my first show and i just saw him just the other day the picture the night the picture that you used the uh, with me that's actually me saying 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, freedom, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That was from that night. I saw Owen Gray. We opened, we Scatolites backed Owen Gray nice. at, at the West Indian Club in Trenton, New Jersey in late April 1988. That was my first show. Wow. Crazy. And that again was a little weird because. We weren't doing Owen Gray like ska tunes. He wanted us to do, as a matter of fact, he gave us the afternoon we arrived there <laughs> to play the show, gave us a tape of all this lover's rock that was like overproduced right. synthesizers, like layered. I'm like, number one, which bass player is going to play this? This man doesn't play electric bass. Right, right. Like, yeah. Oh, so on. So we put together a set. We Scatterlights did, you know, a fair amount of instrumentals. We put together a set for Owen Gray. I think he literally came on at something like three in the morning. Jeez. <laughs> we had, you know, there was Curry Goat. There was. Well, that's why it's Curry Goat. Yeah. It's a late show. It was show. Literally a, a large Jamaican neighborhood in Trenton, New Jersey. That was the, the West Indian place was, uh, um, was an old Masonic hall. Was I kind of chuckle about that, but anyway, right, right. that was my my first, and then we did, you know, we did a few shows. We had the same manager as like Toots, Third World, and all these bands, but we weren't getting much work. Mm -hmm. few, we did one thing where it was us, Sister Carol, who was also managed by this person, right, and uh, Toot. So it's Toots, Sister Carol, and us. Could you tell us the lineup at this time? The lineup of, of the, the band at, at this yeah, time? Yeah, well, Roland, Roland, and, Roland was one of the first people to move to the U.S. in the 70s. So Roland was here. Lester was here. And it kind of depended on the gig, whether those two were even invited. Because depending on the budget, and Tommy was trying to, you know, run the band a certain way. So Tommy was the leader. Tommy McCook on tenor sax. We used most of the time at that time. We used Ron Wilson on trombone, who was from the military band, and he's on a, quite a few records. And trumpet was kind of rotating with this circle of. They were all students of the same guy, who was the guy that ended up coming with us when we did the first real headline tour. Mm -hmm. In 1990, Frank Gordon. Nice. 
was the teacher of these other students, one of which was E.J. Allen, there was James Zoller, Patrick Rickman, then uh, there was a guy, there was a West Coast guy too called Robbie Kwok. Wow. Asian. Kwok. Guy. Yeah, he was at San Francisco. Dude. Did, and the drum and bass at this time? They, oh, Nibs and Brevet, man. Nice. So we got Nibs, Brevet, Tommy. Uh, and Devin, Saxo- Devin okay. on guitar. Devin, Devin on guitar. Oh, who I yeah. named my son after, by the way. My son's name is Devin, too. Nice. Dang. Roger um, Steffen's De- son is named Devin as well. So, uh, At a- that time, I had never heard that name before in my life. By the De- time my son got to preschool, when he was like two or three, there was like a girl and a boy with that name. Yes. What year was your son born? 89. So I, wow. I was born in 83, and I was, I was the only Devin for many, many years. As I got older, there started being more Devins. But, spell with um, an I, spell with an A. Yeah. You guys were ahead of the curve, man. Yeah, you, I'm with an I. You yeah. guys were the way it should be. Ahead of the game, the way it should be the right way. He's like, oh, I'm the right way. And spelled <laughs> the right way with the I. Devin nope. James was a solid guitarist. Devin James was there for like 23 years holding it up. Wow. Because I didn't stay in the beginning. You know, I, I was there for like two years. And I just, I put together, well, we did the Bunny Whaler tour, which you know about that. Tell which, us about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was Jackie came in on that, which Jackie was already diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease by that time. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was so Dizzy Johnny was already playing with Bunny Whaler. That was the first time that Dizzy Johnny played in the Scatterlight for a while because there was a big falling out when they tried to do the reunion, which was actually why they tried to do the reunion in 83. And they, you know, it didn't, it didn't take. They made the the Big Guns album. They before that, they made the the Rolling Steady album, and that's the one with da- Jackie and Dizzy on it. Wow! By the time they made the Big Guns album, which was not very much longer, they had already had a falling out. Dizzy and Jackie were not on the Big Guns album. And the falling out at that point, when you say falling out, you mean like because Tommy being the leader. It's so like we're, a, we're a getting along, you know, it was right with, with the kind of egos we're talking about. It was a tough situation. From wow. Day, from day one. Right. Yeah. And, and you know what? That's fair to say, right? Because you think of the Scottalites and you think of, OK, they're the Scottalites. But obviously how it progressed after that was pretty much they were an all star band before all star bands. You know, every single member went on to form their suit, their their dope band, whether it's Tommy Cook and the Supersonics, Roland Alfonso, Soul Vendors, Jackie Matu was a name. So I could see that when you say egos. I mean, you know, we're all human, but I, I'm sure it was interesting, you know. So anyway, the, the lineup was, oh, well, let's see. So, so Dizzy Johnny was playing trumpet for this particular part, tour. But it was a very unique situation, especially a little bit hairy in the beginning because those two had to kiss and make up before it could go on. And it had to happen right there and then. Mm-hmm. You know, we arrived in California. Those guys had to suck it up and, and behave themselves and play together. And they right. did. It was cool. So anyway, there was just so much history, you know, and I was just getting to know all of it because it was my first real tour. I mean, there was four tour buses. There was two for Bunny's band, which was 18 people on stage. They gave us a tour bus. So there was whatever, nine or 10, they put one of the the artist liaison. And then, then they had a whole bus for staff because it was Neville Garrick on on lights we had all of bob marley's people then right dennis nice. thompson was the uh front of house engineer a guy named soji was the monitor guy so you know there was you should have seen the percussion section we had harry t sticky nice um carl ayton was on drums i believe he died shortly after that he was the drummer for a band called blood fire posse and anyway, at one point, there was 
all of that going on percussively. They were doing big sound checks every day, you know. And then Lloyd Nib got up there along with all that percussion already happening and started playing a set of timbales. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, man. Who was playing bass with Bunny Whaler on that tour? <sighs> what year was this? You, you probably said. But I 89. Okay. Liberation Tour. Boy, I don't remember, you know. I might not know who, who he was then, but hmm. yeah, I'll, let me think about it as it goes by. Yeah. But they won the Grammy for the album. And was that oh, um, liber, Liberation or what, what yeah. was it? Protest or something like that? No, right? Liberation. Liberation? No. And the tour was a little bit of a financial failure because originally there was supposed to be a lot more shows. It trickled down to eight shows. There was four tour buses. Like, do the math, you know. It's just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's four more than I ever had in any band. That was a... <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was an education and a half for me. And I, between the people I met, because Bobby Ellis on on Bunny's band, it was Bobby Ellis was with no horn section with Dizzy Johnny. Wow. Um, the Bailey brothers, which was Barrington Bailey. And I believe Everton Bailey on set. Mm. I think that's how it went. So Dizzy would play with Bunny, but was Dizzy playing with the Scottalites? Yes, that's the thing, you know. A little tension there or, or whatnot. But it was, no, it, it was fine after the, you know, they just had to break the ice, basically. Right, right. And Diz, yeah. Dizzy had his own tour bus, too, so, you know, he didn't have to really <laughs> hang out with anybody. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, he, he did. He ended up coming with us and hanging out. And I, I have so much footage of that. I have about eight. Dude, hours. I have about eight hours of video from talking on the tour bus, Revit playing coffee cups, drum. Ken, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly, I'm gonna fly to Rhode Island. We're gonna go. We're gonna go on your boat, and we're gonna edit video. I can't. I want to see that. Yeah, man. that's, that's crucial. insane. Wow. I'm, <laughs> To have yeah. footage of that tour. So do, do you have yeah. like Actually, do, some do you of have... it on YouTube already? Because oh, I nice. gave it to a guy for um, a school project. If you look for something called Skava Nagila, nice. That's Great. Where you saw that's where you saw that clip you asked me about, Roger. Oh the yeah. Where Jackie Matu is. Well, oh wait a minute, Ken, 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 Ken. We're gonna elaborate on that more. But you know what? Uh, I actually uploaded that clip here, and so we're gonna play the clip that you're talking about, and we could elaborate on it more. Devin, do you mind playing that clip? Yeah, let's play that. Check this out. Check this right. out, everyone. Okay. Scope this, this clip out. This is what out. Ken is talking about. Here we go. So this is 1989. All right, here it is. Play the clip. Chant short to nine millimeter. Maybe if the commercial company wanted to do something, I'd have to go like this. It's Maxell. Or it's Maxell. <laughs> or maybe. What's happening at home? You see it. We need some Max. Hmm. <laughs> Or <laughs> Maxell's the best. Maxell's the best. Maxell's the best. <laughs> or Oh, no, like Maxell. <laughs> <laughs> or this is getting silly, Jack. <laughs> Maxell. <laughs> what a ham. Really good night. Uh, you know, I bet you didn't buy the last one because it's too stupid. <laughs> oh man, dude! <laughs> wow, that is good. Isn't wow. that so you cool? You know, like Maxell. Yeah, he was uh, quite the character. I, I mean, that alone, man, because you know, obviously, uh, as a keyboard player, you know, he's he's a huge hero. And so, when you try to look at for footage of Jackie, there's really none out there, and yeah. and it gives you a perspective when you say in there he's a ham. I'm, that's exactly what I would. <laughs> would describe him as after seeing that, you know. Oh, he was big time. The best part of that, and I know we all we all saw that, is when he genuinely made Roland, like, just laugh. Like, you could tell that Roland's just, you know, it's super genuine. What, what was the story with that? Was that, like, after a show or something? That was actually 
right before they went and they flew and I actually posted a song. They went to Japan and they became a different Scatolites. Roland, Lester, and Jackie left us the night or the morning after you saw that. Wow. And because the, the Bunny Whaler tour, first of all, there were some problems at that point. We were supposed to play in Minneapolis. We didn't play. Then we drove to St. Louis, and that's where we were when that's that's taken. And we were supposed to have played that night, and we didn't because they changed the club. Well, they changed it to a club instead of a theater. There was supposed to be no alcohol. All kind of stuff was in the contract, so we didn't play. So at that point, those guys went and joined a whole nother rhythm and horn section that they filled. There was Winston Grennan, Brian Atkinson, Lynn Tate on guitar. Wow, man. Um, that's another story. I played with all those guys in other bands. So, and then it was David Madden, Bubbles, Cameron on trombone. So they mishmashed all that into a different Scatolite. Meanwhile, we stayed, went to play in Boston and, and played at, at Radio City Music Hall, actually, with no, none of those people. Like, we went from a, like a 10-piece band to a, like a six-piece band or something. It was kind of, mm -hmm. I, believe, I believe the review said, underwhelming. <laughs> wow. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Um I have a question. Like, uh, I'm I'm just thinking about the Scatolites and Bunny Whaler being on tour together. And do you do you have some? I mean, because okay, you got Bunny Whaler, who, you know, obviously the Scatolites and you know people like Roland and Jackie all know Bunny from. I mean, they were already deep in the music business before Bunny came along, and they were there right from his first recordings and things like that. So I mean. Did, were you witness to some? I, I just want like I would love to be a fly on the wall, and you're like the the fly on the wall if you don't mind the reference. No, listen to this story. This is so funny too. As a matter of fact, so we're playing in Santa Barbara. We had to play at the county county bowl, and the curfew was like ten o'clock. So Scatterlight's got like a twenty minute set, and then Bunny did his normal two and a half hour. So there was a bunch of kids, and they had like valley accents and the whole bit i was cracking up it's my first trip to california mm -hmm. as well as my first tour so i see all these kids with like pork pie hats and the black and white suit and all these ska bands you know i didn't really even know what the hell it was all about but roland had records from studio one with him he had you know a stack of them that's what he did for a living when he wasn't playing in the band he sold records at a at a patty shop in in Brooklyn. Wow. So he literally carried suitcases full of records, old studio. So there he is standing that by the side of the stage. My buddy, like, hey, get your and plus that not only can they buy the record, but they can get it signed by A Roland Alfonso. And now we got a crowd going. So all these kids were saying, Well, we paid twenty two dollars to see the satellite for twenty minutes and blah blah blah. Scatterlight should or Bunny Whaler should have opened for the Scatterlights and so on and so forth, you know. And I was cracking up, you know. And there was like literally like a ten-year-old, twelve-year-old kid with a pork pie hat on, and I, I just said to myself, "It's like, man, this is gonna last a long time," you know. And I just started to understand the whole history of the music. Anyway, I was still pretty green. I had only played band playing reggae for barely two years when I got in the Scatolite. So it was all, you know, I didn't know what the hell Jamaican ska was. I, I loved the English beat when they were popular. I actually saw their first show in Boston and that made me, fun. but I didn't know, they didn't call it ska. They didn't call it two-tone back. You know, that just was music. It was pop. Mm -hmm. It was pop. So, and I liked crossover. I didn't care. I wasn't like a purist or anything. I was like, like in a lot of stuff that was going on, Sly and Robbie put out this album called Language Barrier with like Herbie on keyboards, Miles on trumpet. Because there was a lot of stuff going on at Compass Point back then. Wow. When Grace Jones, Sly and Robbie was with Grace Jones and 
there was a lot of stuff. They tried to get satellites into that studio at that time and put them on salary. Chris Blackwell offered them salary and all kinds of stuff. They, took, they turned it down. It was like, I don't know what was going on back then, but bad, bad move. So did you, I mean, but what was, did you witness any like interactions between Bunny and, and the guys? Because that's what I would really like love to love to hear about or see, you know, it's like Bunny Whaler and the Scatolites on tour somewhere in middle America talking about, you know. There wasn't a lot of interaction. No. Mostly if there was any, it was between Tommy himself and Bunny. And it was probably business or money related. Wow. Other than that, there wasn't, I mean, there's a lot of interaction with the other musicians, with like Bobby Ellis and all of these people that were on, you know, they, they put a dancer on the tour that we didn't even really know or ask for. And the dancer was a little bit soft. Like it was kind of embarrassing when we were in LA. Oh, when we were in LA on the tour, they added three acts so it was at irvine meadows we played with judy mullet andrew tosh backed by soul syndicate and ross michael and the sons of negus wow. which was at that time smoking and right. i never heard anything like that right. I, was, I was probably there with my jaw on the floor the whole set i was like what was that so were we if there was four acts on that show what would the skylights have been were you guys First, second, third? I think we were third. Direct support. Uh, we might. I mean, those are all heavy hitters, right? So. Yeah, I don't remember quite so well, actually. Wow, that's yeah, a trip. I think, I think Ross Michael was first, and then Andrew. And I don't remember if we went before Judy or not. Probably <laughs> not. I think she would probably would have gone and then bunny that's how i would do it even now maybe i don't know <laughs> well judy was pretty big back then right judy was backed actually by uh roland's son noel noel alfonso wow i gotta check him out pretty, pretty is he a really good drummer well it's very funny another very funny story so the first record i got access to scatolite's record was actually the only record that lloyd had with him when i met him, when he was in the area so it was um, a vinyl of the live show, Live at Sunsplash 1983. Wow. Which was put out by Synergy. And Lloyd never told me that it wasn't him playing on it. And I listened to that record for years and years thinking it was Lloyd Nib on drums. But if you watch the footage, there's a couple of songs, footage from that that are on like the Cool Runnings. There's a Cool Runnings video. It's a bunch of uh, live Sunsplash clips, like yeah. Sugar Minot and all kinds of people on one clip. Anyway, that was it. You know, that was, they will never show the face of the drummer on those clips because it wasn't Lloyd, it was Noel. But as far as here, you know, what you hear, the guy was good, man. Wow. He was could do a good Lloyd Nib. Wow. Of course he grew up. Of course. <laughs> he doesn't have to listen to the records. He listened to the real thing, you know, right there in front of him. Uh how long was that bunny tour? How how long did, did that last? About two weeks. Okay. It's so really up, compact. We went all the way across the country in four tour buses and never played a show in between the coasts. That's a trip. We rode 3,000 miles. Jeez. One, one bus rode, rode, ran out of gas twice in one day. We spent about 24 hours in the state of Arizona. We were like the rescue bus because our driver was like <laughs> one of the more on-the-ball drivers. Right. We I were mean, like the rescue bus. Like We were the ones that had to go help the idiot that ran out of gas. And when you run out of gas in a diesel, it's not so pretty. I would just, man, like Devin talks about being a fly on the wall. And Devin, everyone here, we've all, we're touring musicians. So we know how it is. Uh, I can just imagine that whole caravan stopping at a flying J somewhere. Oh, and, and, we left Keith Sterling in a, in a, in a, at the truck stop. There was no cell phone. Dude. He drove, 
he was in Ohio. We drove halfway through the state of Pennsylvania. Someone said, hey, where's Keith? <laughs> yes. And they literally had to send a bus back to get him. And that must have been, you know, that was like a four hour. We had been driving at least oh, geez. two hours. No cell phones at that time. No, no yeah. way to contact anybody. Like, that was crazy. This Keith Sterling, that was, you know, that was Keith Sterling on keyboards. Um, a dude they called Asher. Oh, was, John, yeah. Um, and another dude they called Red Fox. Red and, Fox was think, like a dance hall artist. Uh, maybe, but, but no, I think he was a keyboard player. And who else? Was that on? was Burgundy Fox. A couple, oh, yeah. of, couple of Gitsies. But that band was huge, you know, but, and they had dancers. Wow, dancers, that's a trip. What they called the Switch Dance Troupe, but I guess... Only one guy. That was what happened. One, either one or two of those dancers didn't get their visa. Something went wrong with the visa. Mm-hmm. Right. So they used the budget to give us this dancer called Persian, and Persian hadn't danced in quite a while. And Persian was a bit tough. <laughs> so, so anyway, this show at Irvine Meadows, right? Here we are now. We're at this huge show, and it was awesome. So there right. was this group of dread. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, we're hanging in the backstage, and they all had like dreads, like down to the floor dreads. I'm talking dreads, deep. Yeah, so there's at least like three of them, and they saw this this older guy trying to dance out there on stage, and they decided, without being asked, they went out there and started dropping legs, as they call it. And I'm telling you, man, with the dreads flying and the way these guys were really doing their little ska dance thing. Wow. That was serious. Better than Persian. Definitely. Persian would like do a split and not couldn't get up. (laughs) Persian needed to just know when to call it. He knows when to call it. So did you, when you were uh, (laughs) playing with Jackie, did did he, did you, I mean, did he like, did you pick up a lot of reggae keyboard tips from him? I mean. You know, it's funny. Even Winston Wright was the other guy I hung out with a lot. Me too. But when when I saw Winston, Winston would be like, oh, Ken's here. I have the evening off. And he would just, like, give me the keyboard. And, oh. Wow. And I'd stand up there and play a couple of times with Bubble Wall. Um, there was another guy, Bernie P- Pitters, that played with um, Toots a lot. I sat in. I never actually toured with Toots, but I sat in with him umpteen times. Like, and I was trying to figure out how many times I probably saw him. Must have been close between 75 and 100 times. Because I was friends. It was like a family. Like, and especially, you know, when we finally cut, Toots made sure that Scatolites were included on that True Love album. He didn't have to do that. There was right. amazing amount of artists that have been on that thing. But Scatolites were on it. And it was, you know... It really helped us, and the only Grammy-winning record I play on. Right, right. I'm, and and definitely, I want to go back to Devin's question because, man, that's question of the year for me. That century is d- having a relationship with Jackie, Jackie Matu, like just for for a little bit. To tell us what what uh, lasted like eighteen months, and then he died. And that, right, right. Okay, so there's the story about the show in. Toronto. So they started talking about a show bringing Desmond Decker over from England and having Desmond with his band, the Aces and the Scatolites on the same show in Toronto. So that started, that talk started shortly after I met Jackie. You know, I stayed in touch with him once I met him. So we started making these plans and, you know, he was having ex- exacerbations, I guess with the disease, you know, he would go in the hospital, he would come out. So we, this went on and on. And the show was planned for September of 1990, I guess. Yeah. So by the time it, and then, you know, it was, it looked like it was going to fall through. And then I was supposed to be included as keyboard player. And then, then they said, no, I don't want to pay for two keyboard players. We just want you, Jackie. So literally, Jackie calls me like on the day of, day before the show. Says to me, Ken, you need to come up here. I'm not going to be able to play the show. 
He said, I'm too sick. I, I can't do it. So I got on a plane and I went. And I got there like the day of the show, pretty early flight. And I walk into the bar and it's Lynn Tate, Dismond Decker, and Tanamo sitting wow. at the bar. It was like 11.30 a.m. And I walk in and here's my introduction to these guys. No, I hadn't met Tom. Had I met Tanamo? Yeah, I guess I hadn't. Tanamo showed up. That's right. Tanamo showed up on the, the Bunny Whaler show at the Radio City Musical. But he didn't end up singing. I'm not going to tell that story why. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, so now I see these guys. And the show actually was really cool. It was with Roy Shirley. Nice. Who was a pretty unique. I had never heard of Roy Shirley. We, you know, the, the band I was in backed Roy Shirley and it ended up being his last show. He passed away about two weeks after that. Wow. Yeah. Which band was this? The Expanders. And you said somebody else that you knew that I mentioned before. Winston? Winston Wright? I did not know Winston Wright, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know him. I know him, his music. I, I feel like I know him. Yeah. Um, but so so then Jackie, uh, obviously you had a relationship with them, even if it was short, it was relationship. Did you ever bond on a level as keyboard players? Like, was there any, was it just a relationship, a business type thing? Or did you guys able to, you know, have fun around the keyboard? There was another time when I went up there and it was, I was really disappointed because he said he was going to put together a show with the two of us. Well, there was another show that weekend, and it was a huge show, which I helped, I enjoyed the hell out of. It was um, a Delroy Wilson. I think it might have actually been a benefit for Jackie. It was a Delroy Wilson show in 1990, like in the summer, though. Anyway, Jackie was... He put together this show, but there was like no promotion, no flyer, no nothing. And we, you know, we the two of us played together in this bar and we did like songs like Darker Shade of Black and Ram Jam and Who Done It. <clears throat> and nobody came. Maybe 10 people came. Yeah. It was in some not very nice place in a not very nice section of Toronto. And that just was kind of weird. And it was just kind of lumped in. Uh, the, the, the weekend turned into this weird thing where I, I had a great time at the Delroy Wilson show. There was so many people. I met so many people that night. Wow. How was Delroy at that moment? Was it, was he, was he on fire? Was it still? Oh yeah, man. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh yeah. And, and how about Jackie? In, in his final days, did he still did he still I mean, have the he was, magic? It was funny because he literally that show that I was talking about the Roy Shirley. The, so so I never finished what what actually happened. Yeah. There. So you said you saw him at the bar at eleven a.m. Okay. So so Jackie was not in the picture at all. You know, Jackie was still in the hospital, and as far as I knew, I was playing the thing. So we went to the rehearsal and meet all the rest of the people and blah blah blah. So when it came time for the show now, about maybe th not even 30 minutes before we actually went on stage, in comes Jackie, dressed like really well-dressed. Mm -hmm. He's got like two guys with him, almost carrying him, like, you know, because he was, he was barely walking, I think. And he said to me, he said, Ken, I want you to stand behind me all the whole show. He's like, I literally want you to stand behind me. Wow. And I stood behind him the whole show. And then it, mm. it, he finally gave me the keyboard for like, you know, how he always plays Freedom Sound for the last time. Yeah. <laughs> he finally gave me the keyboard. Just He's like, oh, Ken, yeah. Because they weren't going to, I thought I was going to get called up to at least do one song. Yeah. But it was clear that this was like the last song. So I just went up and played for a second, but. I didn't care, you know. I was happy to go and help him and just of course. to meet Desmond Decker and this whole show. The Pluggy Satchmo was another one of the 
the highlights of this show. Pluggy Satchmo was a guy who does like ballads and like Blueberry Hill and right. he did some he was dressed in a white suit with white shoes and he did some ska dance and some moves and he was just in complete hot shit. Like wow. That was that was a blast. The whole That's thing crazy. Boy, Shirley. I don't I think I was paying the least amount of attention because we were probably down in the backstage like talking to everybody else. Desmond is banned. It was a big show, you know, for me for that particular time. Other than who is, oh, go on. What were you gonna say? Oh. Well, I was gonna ask: Is there a moment? I mean, you've played with so many and met so many Jamaican musicians, you know, from the legendary days. Is there is there someone that stands out in your mind as like a person when you met them that you were just like starstruck? Like, well, I can't believe this is so and so. No, right most here. of them. Most of them. You know, I mean. Yeah. Well, actually, with Toots, one time when I sat in with Toots, it was Teeny Hodges. They had just put out the um, Toots in Memphis, mm-hmm. and Teeny Hodges was it was Andy Bathford. I'm not sure if Winnie was on that tour. One might have been Winston Wright, but there was another keyboard player called Bernie Pitters who was from Toronto. We ended up, he ended up going blind and he stopped touring with with Toots, but. Um, I can't remember who was playing keys on it, but anyway, Teeny Hodges, like, and I just remember just, I didn't even want to play myself because, you know, I wasn't supposed to be there. I was already sitting in and he was playing all these little subtleties, like the stuff that you hear on some of these classic tunes that, that he right. put on, you know, like. He just the way everything he did, I just wanted to listen. Like, but I was right there on stage. Like, so I was hearing the, the monitor or whatever. It was like, I feel like that every time I play with Devin on stage, I'm just like I, in awe. Like, yeah, well, it gets it gets annoying. Honestly, <laughs> that was a big one though. That was at the Paradise in Boston, and I was I was a little bit, nerd, you know, I was still getting stage fright at that point, especially when That's we good. took it. <laughs> Like Radio City Musical and stuff like right, right. You know, when you stop know, getting stage fright, that's kind of like you know when that when the stage fright's gone, it's kind of like okay, what's what's missing here? The four four balconies is like wow. Right, right. Jeez. <laughs> um, <laughs> man, I, I almost want to go down the line. So of Winston the... Grennan. All right, so Winston Grennan kind of came in early in the picture. So Toots too because. This, this band in Rhode Island that we opened for everybody. So we start, you know, Toots was one of the first people. He Toots came through the area like once every three months back then. Mm-hmm. The 80s was like, Boston, first of all, was like the, a bigger reggae mecca than New York. Boston, the place called The Channel, they were doing all the reggae, African, anything like, you know, good alternative music was going to this club, even James Brown. They, and it was like a 2,000 person venue. So they could, you know, they could do just about anybody. Mm-hmm. So that's where the English B played when they came over. Cause that before, well, I guess, yeah, it was the channel then. Cause it, before that it was a disco. It was, you know, in the seventies it was a disco and they, they kept the, they had those, you know, those big color organ things that were in the disco floors. And yeah. They kept all that from the disco mm. and when they put in the reggae place. Or the, the alternative club because they did a lot of rock too, but they were doing so much. And I ended up befriending all of these people and Harry Boris, Kevin Aylmer, big up yourself. <laughs> and, um, Man, um, geez. This was like the biggest club that Boston probably ever had. There's a podcast going on, the channel podcast, there's, there's all kinds of stuff going on with that. So, anyway. Um, I forget why I was saying that Boston was the reggae mecca, but we were talking about Starstruck. Yeah, yeah some yeah. of just I mean everybody. Well, first of all, there was the Whalers true, show. Huh? There was the Whalers show and the Whalers played for the first time in Boston since Bob died. And Roger Steppens was there actually. Mm-hmm. And I can remember it was just like almost like the second coming. The, the rider was ridiculous. <laughs> it was like what? No green jelly beans? 
the, the rider, the whole thing. But it, it was it was a big deal, you know. Bob Bob's band finally came through. I right. Was singing at that point. This was like 1988. But I met Roger, and of course, Roger seeing Lloyd. Then I was there with Lloyd, and Roger like literally like kissed his hand and got down on his knees, and, and uh, you know, was so excited to be in the presence of the the reggae ska royalty. Yeah. But um, so getting to know Toots, the drummer for Toots at this time was, well, first of all, let me talk about when I first met Toots the first time, because it was funny because I was literally standing there already talking to him, but I didn't know it was him because the only artist I met before him was Burning Spear. And he was, you know, the dreads and all, just a little more like, not so much in the mix for mingling with people. So anyway, I'm sitting with, with Will, Wilson Blue, the singer in my band, and he has Toots in front of me. But I don't know it's Toots. And I said to, the, to Blue, I said, so where's Toots? And he Toots just looks at me and goes, a me dad, mom. <laughs> and immediately, I'm like, but he looked like, like stop lying. But he was like the age of his son. And his son was there, too. And his daughters, the three daughters on, on vocals, the son playing bass, Hopeton, and but Toots looked, I don't know, he looked to me like 35 years old at that point. I was just like, my mouth, I'm sure, dropped when he said he was him because I just, you know, I didn't, I expected a, an older person. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even starting to gray yet. I mean, he was just, you know, pretty young. He was eight, 86, so. So anyway, now here's Winston Grennan on drums. So just hearing that was amazing. But meeting him, Winston lived in Woodstock, New York area. And Winston was running his own band called Winston Grennan and Scar Rocks, which I was soon invited to play keyboards for. And, you know, we got friendly. But Winston used like Lynn Tate on guitar along sometimes it would be Lynn and Andy Bassford. And he ended up getting this guy, Stewie, Stewie from the Cables. Mm -hmm. it was like Earl Stewart or something like that. We worked with the Cables once, but I forget. Stewie came up to live with Winston and sing in the band, but he ended up staying so long. And Winston had a problem with bass players. I'm not sure why, but he just couldn't keep a bass player. He was changing bass players like all the time. So well, that's that's an important relationship right there. You know the drum and bass. So that's probably it. You know, there's a preference for sure. You know, oh no, this man ain't working out. Get the next guy in. Um, a question about Lynn Tate at that point because I feel that Lynn Tate does he does his thing and he does it very very well. He, like no one else can do it. Right when I think of Lynn Tate, it's this rock steady lead. Was he? Is it fair to say he was playing lead guitar? Uh, you know, at this oh, time, yeah, doing all that double in the bass and that staccato. Stuff. Jeez, man. The it's only it's other person I heard that can do it like that, believe it or not, is Phil Chin. And Phil Chin is still with us. He actually lives in the valley. And I'm, I've been meaning to get him on some recordings. But that kind of picking with that kind of setting on the guitar, with that specific reverb, with that everything, you know, Lynn, Lynn created that. So. Mm -hmm. So I could imagine, you know, because granted, there's not every song is going to be rock steady at that point with Winston's band, but you could still hear that cutting through, you know. We uh, we used Phil when we put together a, a version of the Sound Dimension, uh, which Brian Atkinson and was actually myself on keyboards and Sparrow, the guy who plays drums for Scatolites, and we put together a Sound Dimension that was. Carl, um, Vin and Cannonball, and Dev, actually Devin from Scatolites on guitar. We had a blast. We played in Japan for um, Gaz Mayall's club 30th anniversary of rock and blues. You didn't play his club, did you? Did you guys play the actual club? No, that's in London. Oh, that's in London. Yeah, my bad. Because that's like a. This was in Tokyo and a couple of different cities. It was a great tour. 10 years ago exactly it was supposed to be the 40th anniversary this year poor gaz big up gaz jason great guy in japan yeah. 
Chris Kurosawa, all the people in Japan, man. Right. Boy, we miss everybody this year. Man. Definitely, man. I mean, we're in the middle of their 55th anniversary tour because our tour, our anniversary is in June. So our anniversaries tend, tend to span two years, you know. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. We did a, a whole bunch of stuff in 2019, and we were about to do a whole bunch more. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we got shut off. And Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeez, man. It must be crazy, like, because all of us here in this little bubble, but you more than even me and Roger, you know, have just been touring for so long. And it's just, it must be just insane to have the rug swept under you like this. This is the first year I've been home in 10 years. I had, there was another year in 2009 I had some issues and I didn't end up going up on tour with the Scatolites. And I stayed home and played with a local band and then did a lot of boating. And that was another summer. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed myself this summer. I sailed, I camped. Cool. But no music, man. Yeah. Right. It's like very little. I, I got to play a couple of gigs. I actually played my first gig on bass. Thank you, nice. Kitson and Greenlee. Nice. Man. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a trip. My when... big chance on bass. Nice. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's gonna be a trip when we all get to play music again. You know, we have those like those first shows where it's like a real show. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, because it's something it's something you you take for granted. You know what I mean? It's just human nature, right? You try not to, but just when you're doing something so often every night, you kind of just take it for granted. And then when it's gone like this. Yeah, it's like hitting the reset button. All the all the the giggles will come back. Yeah, Roger and I did a show a few months ago that was like at a socially distanced venue that there was no real audience. It was all like live stream, but it was at a venue that was set up for live streaming, and it was like people from Fishbone and different artists within the kind of like American reggae rock scene. And Roger and I were talking about how when certain artists started to play, we were just like we didn't realize until the moment they started playing how much we missed live music and just like certain artists that we never would have even really like watched. We were just kind of just <laughs> thoroughly enjoying their set just cause it was right. like another human being like playing music in a room yeah. with us. It's like food, yeah. ear food, ear food. Yeah. Like, yeah, for sure, man. Ken, um, you know, I realize we have to turn our, our this interview into segments, man. We got to have yeah. volume one, volume well, two, happened? volume three. Well, we usually sum up the show around now just because of the really? length of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. It's an hour and a half is usually what we rock. Um, but you know what? Before we go, well, let's... Oh. <laughs> what are you that long? What are you drinking there, Ken? By yeah, the way, you I drink? know you have your sandwich. It looks like hot, hazy IPA, but it's yeah. actually uh, non-filtered apple juice. Mm -hmm. oh. But I do have a sampler pack of uh, Long Trail Ale, including... Green Blaze IPA. Blaze it. And, uh, some Green Blaze as well. Before, Very nice. Before we go into I the I want fun. to say one th important thing. Yeah, go for it. Because Scatolites are doing a live streaming. Yes, please. October 30th, live from Sony Hall in Manhattan. Wow. Scaloween with special yeah. guests Alfonso Castro who was the original dancer that came from Jamaica in 1964 to perform at many places, including the World's Fair. Wow. And Larry McDonald, which yeah. you know, Larry McDonald is famous for many reasons, but uh, is technically an original Scatolite, actually. Right. He, yeah. he was on records and live shows back then. Right. Larry, of course, plays with Dave Hillian's Rock Rock. Uh, Rock Steady 7. 7. Yeah. And he plays with uh, Emps and the subatomic thing that right. Lee, Lee Perry. Perry. Yeah. And also with Dub as a Weapon sometimes with Lee Scratch Perry. Right. Uh, I got to do a gig and a and a session with Larry McDonald with Dave Hilliard um, a couple years ago here in Venice. Yeah. Big up Larry. Yeah. He's a, he's a cool guy. Well, yeah. We just started advertising it this week. It's on our all of our social media stuff and we're expecting to have a bang up show. We're going to have some guest musicians. Uh, I thought Monty was going to stop by, but Monty wow. will be on vacation. 
That would have been cool, uh, man. Yeah. I'm so glad he's getting out because he's been. Did you watch any of Monty's streams? Like, actually, yeah, when he first started rocking them. Oh for my sure. god, they're all archived too, so you can go back. Yeah, to yeah. What that guy is absolutely amazing. Man. Him and so, Wrangling are on their own. Yeah. What's for the, sure. What's the date again, Ken, of the Scatolites thing? October thirtieth for oh, yeah. United States, and then there's going to be a rebroadcast for Europe on the following day on Halloween. And we're going to be on that rebroadcast. It's going to be even more unique because the Scatolites are going to be on there watching with the Europeans so that we can chat with them. Nice. Very cool. And, uh, Europe is our strongest market. We probably would have been there three or four times this year as we were last year. And we miss everybody everywhere, man. It's, it's, it's a sad, you know, we're trying to get some new music out. We've got, uh, you know, we've got Vin Gord. Uh, yeah, actually, you guys should try to reschedule that Vin Gord. And, yes, we definitely. Uh, you, he said he, yeah. he'd love to do it now. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, still, we're still plugging at it. That's and awesome. We're everybody. We hope next year we can at least do a driving tour or something. We're, you know, we have, uh, we're working with Skyline now. Thank you, Adam Davis, for the live streaming. Thank you, Flo, for all you do for me. Yes, yeah, Flo's awesome. Lights. Yeah, and you know everybody, you'll you'll start seeing some stuff coming from the Scatolites. We're gonna get, we've got a bunch of stuff in the can, but you know, especially some of the folks in our generation don't do so well with this remote stuff, and it's just, we got we're the scattered lights. We're scattered I... here and scattered there. <laughs> scattered lights, I love it. You should give yourself more credit. Every 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 uh, person from your generation, as you put it, that we've had on the show has done has done great with the with the whole situation. Yeah, everyone, and we've had we've had a lot of cool uh, OGs on here, and it's seamless. You so, know, if yeah, so yeah, Roger, I've, seen, I've seen most of the OG stuff. It's been great. Nice, Thank nice. No, oh, this is great. Thank you. So before we let you go, though, uh, as Raj mentioned in our sound check, we like to do a little segment that we call rapid fire lightning round questions yes sir and so we're just gonna ask you some some quick questions don't think too much just just fire off the answer yeah right? and um i gotta start because you know we go for it roger and i saw you eating that uh delicious sandwich at soundcheck and so um i gotta ask you uh mayonnaise or mustard well, that was from that was a Wendy's grilled chicken sandwich, and they put some <laughs> nice, some kind of like weird honey mustard thing. I think. Okay, mustard. Okay, so mustard really is. Mustard, but right. but yeah, like okay, in general, cool. in general, in life, in life. Yeah, like this mustard. is like I'm yeah. a mustard guy. I don't mustard love guy. I check you as a mustard guy. All right. Okay. Wow. Good. That's a, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. French Dijon and all that. Yeah. Yeah. De Devin's a mayo guy, right, Devin? I, I do. I do like mayo. Yeah, a lot. and and I'm sure Devin doesn't mind, I make, but I make Dijonese too. You start Ooh, combining nice, nice, it, nice, huh? Yeah, yeah. I like hot sauce. I'll take hot sauce over all that three. That choice. Um, anything with wasabi. There you go. That's nice. Anything wasabi on anything, I'll eat it. I am opposite. You get wasabi in the same room with me, and I'm crying, baby. I'm <laughs> crying. So while we're on food, let's just go for it. Pineapple on pizza? Yes or no? Are you a fan? Okay. All right, Devin. Next one. Um, well, this is not so much a yes or no question, but I just want to know, and just like quick, quick answer, like what was the first record you ever got? Do you remember like this being, this is my first record and I love this record. Tommy James and the Shondells, Crimson and Clover, was first 45 I bought, I was probably 10. Nice. All right. That's crazy. All that right. crazy reverb on the guitar. Oh, wow. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's great. Like, is it going through a Leslie or something? There's some effect going on there. Oh, God knows. All right, some kind of weird trip. Um, so I'm sure you could elaborate, but we're just looking for something quick. I'll put you on the spot here. Favorite Scottalite song? Well, that that that's deep, but I know pretty that's much. A rough one. There's this one that's that's very unique. It's called Meat to Come. Okay. It's on so can, you, can you say that again? Meat to Come. Meat to Come, okay. It's on the Big Guns album. It's not a fast tune. It sounds like camels riding across the desert. It's an incredible trombone solo. Dwight Pickney plays guitar on that album. Oh, my Lord. Wow. It, it, I can probably sing 
every thing like i've listened to that album so many times i can right. sing every solo note for note air play it whatever you want yeah i can do it all crazy <laughs> do you get, did 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 Lights ever play that live with you in the band never ever no did you did you try to get him to i used to bug people about it that lloyd was always saying oh we, we need two guitars we need two it's like we don't need two guitars you get the keyboard player to play the guitar fires <laughs> <Listen. laughs> just kidding um you know hold on i want to interrupt this this uh segment because uh, uh, so John Converse, who's been watching the show the whole time, does have a question for you, Ken, and I want to make sure we answer this, so put it up here. He says, Ken, what keyboards were you using in the late 80s? Oh, nice question. Oh, God, I had some rolling thing. Maybe the... M1? RD2. Oh, I hated those. Oh, God. That's an That's 80s cool. one, so everyone everyone used, right? That was an M... That was a Korg. I hated the piano. Korg M1, yeah. Big time. No, I liked the... Digital pianos, digital weighted action, almost anything that was digital weighted action feels and sounds like a real acoustic piano. In ska, in the Scatolites, that's all I played at the beginning. And I started to throw in more and more organ. And then that got to be pretty much the standard Scatolites keyboard setup. Kerry Brown came in with the crew bar, with the draw bars. He was, you know, and then Bill Smith came in using organ sounds. I'm not sure exactly what he was using, a Kurzweil. And then, you know, I, I always used whatever digital weighted action stuff I could. Because I like to keep the muscles up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I don't have a real piano even at home. I, I really want to get one, but. I'm How about now? How about now? Are you just, the, uh, uh, you know, a Nord guy or, or do you prefer a certain rig? Nowadays. I mean, I, I have a nor. I have like seven keyboards, and I think none of them absolutely work correctly. They need to <laughs> all need to go to the doctor. I even have my old JX3P, which was you know pretty much had the same jump sound. I thought of it when Eddie Van Halen, Eddie Van Halen died the other day. It's like I still have that keyboard, but and it's got it's got a really cool thing where. It can be analog, guys. Like it's a digital keyboard, polyphonic, but it's got a magnetically attached thing that turns all these parameters inside that normally you have to change digitally. Now it brings them back to be analog knobs. Wow, so, man. Yeah, it's pretty. If I can get it up and running, it sounds I'm heavy. Gonna, yeah, I'm going to use it in some recordings. If I, Literally heavy, like you know, hard, I, I, hard to carry. I have my local project, Soul Shot. That's much more roots reggae involved, and I do some record. I've, I've played on every one of the albums they put out except for the last one, mm. and you know I I don't do much else except Scatolites and Soul Show. I don't really have time anymore. But right, right. Are we are we that's, busting back into the? That's hold on. I want. It's crazy you mentioned like Eddie Van Halen, and that's that reminded me that it was what a trip, right? Like that Eddie Van Halen. Johnny Nash and Bunny Striker Lee all passed on this on the same day, you know. Yeah, that was weird. That was just a weird day. Like it kept coming across the timeline. There and uh, days like that since the pin, even before the pandemic, we started losing a lot of artists. Even you know, because it's the age thing, it's the generation. You know, it's amazing how many of the Jamaican artists are. You know, like you mentioned, Ernie Rangman. I visited him last. In winter of 2019, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know he's he's 87, but I'm sure if somebody had the right amount of incentive, he'd come out and play. I, I heard he's that he actually huh? he wow. he actually came forward and said, "Okay, this is my last show." I forget when it was, but yeah, it was kind but of that, but he has had a bunch of those, right? Like, I'm yeah. sure I can get him out if I, if I wanted to. Get him out to Northridge. We'll see if we can get a show well, going. Well, you know what happened? We were going to use him on a track, and the guy who just also passed away, the engineer that was operating in his area, Barry O'Hare. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He Barry O'Hare did some, like, Burning Spear dubs, right? Wasn't he's he? Done, he's a, you know. I think some of those, like, some of those, like, later album. Burning Spear dub albums were Barry O'Hare. I didn't know he passed. His, yeah, his, he just passed like right around, right after Twitter, oh, wow. same week, same week as Twitter. Wow. And he actually did some stuff up for Toots, I believe, on the True Love album, some of the tracks on his 
done it either at his studio or by him or something like that. I believe he was involved. I don't know, man. I hear the older someone said the older you get, the more, you know, people around you start leaving us. I guess. I don't know. It just does seem like now more than ever. It's like, wow, especially this year, you know. And with Jamaican art, I tell this to, uh, you know, I talked to Devin about this. Um, just a lot of people is that we're so fortunate as fans of Jamaican music. You know, you look at the, the, the stages of ska, rock, steady and reggae. And right now we still have some of the foundation artists that were there in the ska days. You know, like I can't imagine in like 40, 50 years from now being a fan of ska music and just not ever fathoming that there's a Derek Morgan show going on. You know, being like, wow, Stranger Cole show going you on. were able to see Stranger Cole perform, you know, live. Um, we toured with Stranger Cole so fortunate with that. last year, too. That was another amazing thing we did. Oh, man. Stranger. So we, much fun together. We got to know Stranger pretty well at one point in the 2000, late 2000s. And he's just he's a great guy, man. Stranger. Just lo I love him so much. Yeah. He's such cool to be guy. around his energy is incredible yeah it really is you're right big up stranger <laughs> big up stranger big up stranger man all right ken thank you so much for joining us um like roger said we're definitely going to have you back because uh this is like this feels like a four or five or six part interview so this right. is part one yeah we didn't um, really get past 1990 yet. exactly yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um everyone make sure you go check out um on October 30th, the, the live Scatolites uh, live stream, they're going to be doing Scalloween. And um, please support, you know, this is one of the great institutions of Jamaican music still doing it. And Ken, thank you so much, man. Anything you want to leave the people with? Here's one for you. You recognize that symbol? Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the Tibetan Freem concert. Is that rolling? I, I, I do not own the rights to this photo. <laughs> 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 I acquired beautiful. all of Lloyd Nibs photos. Oh wow! Okay, Jeez, well that's a whole dude. show we got to have you. That's on. a whole Just, other show. My stills alone. Why, like, why you never tell us? I have like five thousand stills, dude. All right. Well, Jeez. we'll do a show. Just that's amazing. That's that amazing. is amazing. Okay. Ken, it's Great. it's yeah. We got to get together and do some something. We're gonna we're gonna people out need to see this. They're gonna freak. <laughs> all right, Ken. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> really really nice cool talking cool. to you. And uh, we'll have you on soon. Um, yeah, man, I try to catch your little guitar thing on Tuesdays, too. Is it nice. Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesdays. I, I love the Justin Hines. You know, I, I bet just that's how I got friendly with Vin. When oh, yeah? When Hines started touring in the, in the 90s, it was Vin and Deadly Headley. Ooh. And so Crazy. I got friendly with them and when Agitators opened for their first show. And then Justin was huge, man. He was I'm sure. He was was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then he, oh man did you play with know. justin i never got to play with him no he's one of my favorites his I band was great most of the song when they first started touring most of the so songs sound just like the record man jeez mighty redeemer live would be insane not right? to, not to take yes, <laughs> yes. That's oh heavy man head. All right, Ken, we're going to do this again probably several times. But uh, take care until we see you again. Hopefully we'll get to see you in person before too long, and we'll all meet up on the road somewhere. Yes, yes Ken. How about Thank some, you. How about some love? How about some Long Beach All-Star Scatterlight shows? Jeez. We're gonna, you, you know the minute that it can happen, it'll happen. Let's do it. Let's Ooh, do it. All, all the, let's do it. I'm that's such a good idea, own. too. We'll make that, that our own, man. That's such a good idea. All right, that's going to happen. Ken, you've planted the seed, and <laughs> yes, that seed man. will bear fruit. Right on, Ken. Right. Well, once again, thank you, brother. And we'll, we'll, we'll right, be man, in man. touch. All thank right. You, brother. Yeah, man. Yay. Ken Stewart, like, there's, I'm telling you, man, you just campfire sessions with Ken Stewart because he's got so many cool stories for sure. Yep. You know? Um, let's see. What do we got cracking next with all the little graphics and slides and all the prettiness? We got this coming. There up. it is. All right. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, we are switch swapping it, switching it up. Um, we're going to be starting to do uh, from now until the end of this year, at least. We're going to do a biweekly thing. So it will be every other Saturday we yes. get together, and it's going to start with taking a break next Saturday. So, the following Saturday, October twenty fourth, we're going to 
they're going to have Miguel Happel in. And, and he, for, for some that may not be super familiar, I mean, he just goes by Miguel and he's, he's, wow. I mean, he's, he owns skunk records. He did own skunk with Brad. He's a producer on all the, the sublime stuff. He was definitely, um, the fourth or fifth member, if you will. I mean, I'm, you know, I know sublime. Sublime was a, there was three people on stage, right. But it was a periphery of people, right. You know, Ross MG, even Opie, um, you know, exactly. Miguel and Miguel, because he did a lot of behind the scenes stuff and was definitely there for the magic. You know, you can definitely, you have to give Miguel credit. And so he is going to come on the show and this is insane. Ladies and gentlemen, he's going to break down the 40 ounces to freedom album. We're going to talk about, what the process is, what it, what it was, what the influences were, um, stories about you know where Brad and, and how where he drew his influences from. Some so we're of the gonna production be, stuff, right? So we're gonna be playing songs. You know, we're gonna have like some of the songs that Miguel says were the influences for certain songs from Forty Ounces of Freedom. We're gonna be playing those and talking about the ways that they influenced Brad and Miguel and the whole Sublime crew, right? And th- and those albums, especially Forty Ounces, even the the production side, uh, you know, it wasn't just straight ahead. It wasn't an orthodox kind of thing, you know, the samples, sample heavy stuff. Mm-hmm. So we're going to have fun with Miguel. He's going to chit chat with us. You cannot miss that. Um, myself, I got some new news cracking. What is with, it? With my side band. All my bands are side bands. There's really not a main band right now. Huh? It's like, oh, stop. You know, <laughs> no, I'm joking. My main band is the Night Owls. Um, <laughs> the Night Owls. Fredo, I hope you're not watching. I, I've, 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 uh, I've, uh, Jesse, been really, really stoked on on how this band has the approach of this band. It's like an all star band. We all have uh, our own studios, and we we record music and fly it around, and it's just a great outcome. We do cover songs, and we get really uh, special guests to sing. And so this new forty five is grooving. That's the song you guys are thinking about. If you're like, oh, is it that grooving song? It's that one. Grooving, you know. <laughs> It's that one. So go to F Spot Records. You can pre-order this 45. There's a vocal on one side, and I'm really stoked because it's my first uh, opportunity with the Night Owls to do an organ version. So there's nice. an organ version of that song. Beautiful, Devin. Um, I was I tuned into your session. I think the last one you I did. I felt that energy when you did. Good, good, like, good. It, it was for a millisecond. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm doing the songbook sessions um, every Tuesday. Uh, come check it out this Tuesday. I think I'm going to be playing some, uh, some. you know, I always take requests and stuff and mix it up, but I think I'm going to do some like Bunny Striker Lee wow. uh, tunes, you know, like he recorded so many, I mean, the list is just endless, you know, but like the stuff, the, my favorite stuff of Bunny Striker Lee and so much is that I do have, and so far as I do have a favorite is like, you know, Johnny Clark and Cornell yeah. Campbell and that era, Barry Brown. Um, so, you know, I was thinking of like playing some of my favorite Bunny Striker Lee productions, you know? Mm, yeah. And the, the production side is not going to shine through so much with one guy playing guitar and singing these songs, but just, I mean, such great tunes, you know? So I think I'm going to do some of that on Tuesday, but everyone come check that out. Uh, Tuesdays at 5 p.m. Pacific. Um, and other than that, man, I, you know, I've been working on this new acoustic record and Roger's been recording it for me. And we just basically wrapped it up last week. Uh, got all the mixes done. Yeah, uh, I've sent it to a couple friends, and and it's it's just really been great to to have this like project that's just been an idea that only you know Roger and myself and Vanessa and my brother Patrick have have you know heard now finally like have something that's that's done, and so I'm pretty stoked on it, and you know I just kind of feel good about that. So yeah. uh, that's something to look out for. You know, I don't know when it's going to be released or anything like that, but the fact that it now is a thing that exists, I'm very happy with. Yes. Yeah. So it's thank gonna, you, Roger, for your help. Oh, with that I mean, record. I mean, it's a. Uh, it's easy as an engineer and, and you know producer, just someone who's who's working with different musics. I think we had this conversation before, but you know you you learn the hard way if you work with music outside of a genre you like. But then even when you work with music in a genre you like, there's still this this sense of work sometimes. So that's why I like to work with artists where I, I thoroughly enjoy their art. And Devin is probably the definition of that. I mean, his songwriting is great. And I know it sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm joking, and part of me is. No, <laughs> yeah. no, these songs are great. Anybody that's a the fan, of, uh, fan of Expander's music and um, you know, you know, the songwriting is, is, is really good. And actually, the direction of this album and, and how Devin 
what instruments Devin chose to use and, and, and some of the approaches are really out of the box. So I think people are going to enjoy that. Well, we'll go, well, I th maybe down the road, we'll, we'll put a little magnifying glass on the album when, yeah. when we, uh, when it comes out. But, you know, I have to say the best thing about working at Roger's studio and granted, you know, Roger's a great producer, great musician, really easy to work with, funny dude. But none of that stuff really, when I think of working with Roger, I don't really think of any of that stuff. I th he's got this bottle of Jolly Ranchers oh, man, and, yes. um, Love and it. Charms yeah. blow pops. Suckers and blow pops. And, yeah. you know, I'm not like a big candy dude, but when I go to Roger's house, I have seven or eight Apple Jolly Ranchers yeah. and a blow pop or two. And they've been in there. These candies, you know, guys, if you know these candies, you know that they can exist for like 80 years, so... Yes. They're just in, in your there. stomach too. I mean, there's just, this whole session exists in my stomach still. Right. Well, Raj, um, <laughs> love it. This has been that was a great, great episode. Thank you to let's see, is this the one we're supposed to be on? Yeah. Oh, Thank yeah. you to our special guest, Ken Stewart. Um, yes. Big up Ken. Big up Flows. Big up the Skylights. And big up yourself, everybody who's watching and listening. I mean, listening. we we appreciate oh, yes. it for everyone listening out there on the podcast. Um, Thank you, because we're getting a lot of positive feedback, and, and it does sound cliche, but that feedback really does make a difference, because we know we're doing something right. I mean, we're doing this, we're, we're having fun doing it, talking about, I mean, come on, you're talking about Jamaican music, talking to people that you look up to, but when we get the response from you guys, and, and all the links, and the tagging, and mm -hmm. just, that, that's really, really uh, special, so thank you for that, everyone yes, out there. really. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, if you haven't gone and subscribed to the Reggae Pod Clash podcast, mm -hmm. please do because you can get this as a podcast. We archive every episode, the audio. Um, and if you do that, please, uh, please rate and review. It helps us out a lot. Yeah. And we will see you all October 24th when we have Miguel from Skunk Records on to break down yeah. the creation of 40 Ounces to Freedom. Until then, fun. everyone be good. And Roger, I'll see you later, man. Devin, we'll see you later, everyone.